My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're going to be talking about chapters 5 through 8 of uh, Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell's From Hell, Jack the Ripper masterpiece, but first a little business. October 1976, my latest comic, the world's first blacklight comic, printed with fluorescent ink featuring the underground Russian superhero Octobriana trying to save the world against robot Stalin and his latest doomsday device. This is in comic stores everywhere right now. Get it wherever you get comics. Get it quickly because it is selling better than I expected. Thank you all very much, but it's going quick. So if you want this unique comic in your collection, grab it as soon as you get a chance. Pittsburghers, I saw these copies, of these uh, versions in Phantom of the Attic. Get them while they're hot. They're not there anymore, I bet you. <laughs> Variants. <They're, laughs> they are about gone. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my current project, Red Room, for the early adopters. Uh, three bucks will get you the complete archive and the images are up there at a high enough resolution that people have been sending me their bootlegs jimmy uh every tuesday new strips go live and issue one as of this recording is almost completely up there by the way if you all love from hell check out red room <laughs> so where we left off jimmy with in our last video there wasn't even one murder no well we're gonna make up for uh <laughs> some lost time and cover i don't know four of them in these next four chapters <laughs> yes uh dude I went to the comic shop just yesterday, pick up some stuff, and I was, I saw a copy of uh, From Hell there. I was kind of curious what the color version was like, and they didn't have a copy there. But they had, you know, th this is a perennial. You keep this on your store shelves. The newer printings are so white on, like, archival paper. It doesn't work as well to me. Like, this is the one that you want. You're not kidding. Format-wise, when they made this decision to put it on, on this newsprint, that was talked about a little bit. Was know, that was a design decision, and I think a very flattering one for this material because Eddie Campbell's art looks like it's of that time period. It looks like the etchings. You know, I, I, I think that's not accidental. I think that was definitely a creative choice he made. And you put it on this kind of pulpy paper, it really flatters it. There is an edition where the edges of the pages are black. This was a very limited version. I've never seen it in person, but it sounds like that might be a pretty good treatment as well. Like a color blocking? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Just like, this like dark, definite. like, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Just sooty kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I think that would also fit the material well, but I like this newsprint treatment. Um, you know, Kitchen Sink did versions of this. It was done in Taboo originally. Very nice paper and reproduction, but something fits with this. This feels gross even when you touch it with your hands. It feels like you should have to have like the black ink on your fingers like like old news, newspapers right? after you read this. So let's talk about soot and grit and get into chapter five. Uh, this is the one that has this kind of juxtaposition of the ink wash and the black and white line. Before you get there... What we're seeing here, uh, conception of Adolf Hitler. Is that what we're looking at? This is his parents, you know, ha having sex about the time that he would have been conceived, which was one of the many conceits of this book, was looking at what are the ramifications of this event, how did it sh shape 20th century, and that's one of the connections Alan Moore makes, is the whole idea of Hitler being conceived around the time period of this happening, which... Maybe a stretch, but interesting from a storytelling point of view. And so that's what these first couple pages are. And then we do get into the comparisons between Dr. Gall uh, and his kind of upper upper class lifestyle with those ink washes compared to the prostitutes who this is amazing. You know, like they would pay their couple of pennies or whatever to stay at this place overnight where you were tied up to the wall. You sat sleeping up tied to the wall so you wouldn't just fall down on the floor cost them as nothing but this would have been like your impoverished life and it made me think like are these characters homeless for the most part they uh whenever you watch these whenever you watch these um documentaries and stuff about uh the the white chapel killings they always talk about the way life was for these girls every day they start from zero and throughout the day you need your like four bucks to uh to have the privilege to, to stay at this place. So by any means necessary, uh, if on a good day, you just rob for that four bucks, uh, on a bad day, you got to fuck some creeps, you know? And, uh, but that was, I hope you don't get robbed. Exactly. And that was, that was day in, day out. Yeah. It's, he paints that picture very effectively. Like the, these lives of the lower class people, men and women that are depicted, just brutal and yeah. that includes like Aberlein, the, the detective 
who has to go back to Whitechapel and does some, just continues to paint this picture, right? Like this is a bleak, dark place, Whitechapel at this time period. Yeah. Cool storytelling stuff where we have these kind of like more elongated panels for the William Gall sections. And then uh, the skinny, narrow third tier, third section is relegated for the prostitute who's just doing what she can to get a couple of shillings. Dude, page architecture as an expression of, of her, you know, less than existence. Right. Man. This piece right here, man, we, it's just it's just a line for the uh, for Gull's, like, petticoat, and you just see that hand. Perfect. Got our little cup of coffee with uh, with uh, the elephant man. Yeah, it's weird, that, that relationship. <laughs> I think that's what, you know, there are a lot of these... What I admire from this book, rereading it, is how many threads Moore is weaving. Sure. With, we see detectives and kind of them doing their work, both good and bad police work. We see the journalists who are doing, you know, new journalism and stuff. There's so many of these different pieces that he's weaving together in here. And I think that's what the Elephant Man stuff is. You know, it's one more, one more piece of this time period that he's painting, the setting that he's creating. And, and weirdly, the Elephant Man is part of that setting, part of the oddity. So one of uh, Alan Moore's conceits is this grand uh, conspiracy by way of the crown. And uh, it goes to the Masons, man, the, the, the brother Masons. So William Gall is letting Scotland Yard know because the, one of the main guys at Scotland Yard is a brother Mason. And he's just like, listen, man, I was ordered by the Queen to kill four motherfuckers, man. So you just got to look the other way. And there's a... Uh, some tribulation, there's some bullshit that goes along with this, man. But ultimately, our Scotland Yard, whatever you would call that guy, the, the Commissioner Gordon of that stuff, is like, okay, I'll just make sure there's just like a real shitty cop. Yeah, to... yeah, the conspiracy part is great. Like, yeah. like this whole story is full of that Mason, the, the, the Masonry connections behind this. And I think he does that conspiracy thing really well with the police because he interacts with this guy's chief of police or whatever that position would be at the top of the line. It's very disturbing that what more the story that Moore is telling here right and, and showing those threads of like well how do you get away with this and it's like connections it's all these upper level people have these connections to each other when you see netley you know there's trouble ahead man he's the igor to the dr frankenstein that is uh sir william gall let's uh there's going to be a, a few call outs to the great eddie campbell throughout these four chapters this row of seeing the 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 through the glass it's not a reflection but the distortion through the glass incredible yes. right? incredible and uh you know that's polly that's going to be our first victim and she emerges from behind that glass in some really impressive drawing william gall gets ready for for uh he kisses his wife good night when he has to go out on the town to go do some business man yeah spends his day looking at like egyptian artifacts Kissing his wife, having nice dinners, shaving, and then uh, heading heading out to, to to kill prostitutes. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that Netley was tasked with, you got to give you got to give this girl a piece of flair. We need to find her. Yeah. Mark her somehow. Yeah. So just like you know when Bubbles in, in the wire is given the the, drug, the important drug dealers the red hat, got to give this lady a bonnet. You know what? I'm glad you mentioned the wire. I felt that several times reading this. We'll point out a couple more as we go through these chapters, but that that's great. Look at that sooty sky. I love it. You almost can't breathe. That's 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 the that's what our homies are dealing with on the West Coast because somebody a couple had to have a gender reveal party and burn up half the fucking country. <laughs> he's poisoning grapes. That's what we're seeing on these pages. Yeah, grapes that he's going to feed to those to his victims uh, once he once he picks up Polly. I guess they're a sedative. It's it's that laudanum stuff, which would have been the anesthetic of the day to to put your ass out whenever s surgery was required. There's a couple of moments like this too. This is like fire and en engulfing, uh, you know, kind of her world. We saw at a panel a couple pages earlier. There was a background that was like that. We're gonna see a few of these examples where, like, the world, the present world, drops away, and we see other stuff. Visions time sort of displacement visions but it's an interesting choice visually yeah you know it creates a mood and again man all these night scenes the coaches the amount of black ink on these pages that still reads it is such a dark 
dark story, right. literally. Right. Pages of pages. It's this is this is uh, at the beginning of Inglorious Bastards when the German officer is there in the house, and we see the people underneath the floorboards. We know what's happening. This is the Jack the Ripper comic. Page after page after page of conversation between the two. It's making you feel for the girl. You know, it's making you... It's it's turning her into a person for us just before the inevitable. But not before they uh, drive by uh, the elephant man. Yeah, and he makes her give a salutation as if it, it was the Indian god that she's talking to. It's It's just... It's such a creepiness that more evokes with this language stuff. We laughed about Netley being made sick as he starts to see the bigger picture, but I felt some of that dread reading this stuff. For sure. You know, like there's such setups to what you know are inevitable, gruesome endings. These characters are so pathetic in so many ways, and to, to just read pages of Gaul's setup, it's really disturbing. Yeah. There's this weird piece, and I'm, I, I'm sure he touches on it in the appendix, uh, where he makes Netley more kind of complicit in the action, you know, take a swipe or something. Uh, could this be, you know, when they find the body in real life, like there's like one cut that seems amateurish, but all the other ones are surgically perfect. So Alan Moore's just building that into his, his narrative because dude, when you read the appendix, which I only glanced over whenever I would have like maybe a little trouble reading a thing, I'll read the appendix and the amount of people walking out of bars is corroborated in books that he read, you know? And these people are incidental. Like, these people are for witness play a little bit later. Um, but it's as accurate as possible down to, down to, to those degrees. I was going to ask you about the appendix. I actually run two bookmarks in my book so that I can flip between appendix and, and foreground for that exact reason. It's so extensive. And it's revealing, like, what information exists and where it comes from. Right. That's really cool about uh, Netley making that cut. I didn't make that connection, but that is why you would put it in there because it's like there's a record of this odd cut. How how would you explain this with right. Gaul? And like it is explained. It's fascinating to read the appendix and go back and forth because all those pieces. And again, this is the uh, the, the uh, mind hunter, you know. Right. With I just picture Alan Moore having all these threads connecting everything and then like adding the fictional scenes you know, in between. And there aren't that many, like, like it's, it's rare, but he'll note whenever something's completely fabricated, but it is fascinating as a storytelling thing to kind of like go back and forth between those notes and see where this stuff is coming from. And I would be wrong if I guessed which parts I think are made up and which parts are accurate or, or at least historically recorded. Sure. Except for when Sir William Gull is in modern day and there's a skyscraper and he's <laughs> looking at that. I, th I think you would be right about that. I part. would guess that one. Yeah. I figure that one out. <laughs> I mean, we could keep going on with this with this first chapter, but basically, first body is discovered, and the entire scene is kind of run over. You know, like once again, the wire. If you if you read that the book that inspired the wire, they talk about the crucial like first first day where you need to collect evidence because the evidence, you know, just your regular patrolman is going to step on important things and all that. Like we we're witness to that throughout this whole series yeah the pieces are are really incredible and it it speaks to the whole way this story is put together it's almost yeah. like i don't know 85 percent of these pieces more has pulled from reference material right and if you lay those out chronologically and where they overlap and then he plugs in the little extra interstitial pieces you need to just kind of make this fit it's it's a it's the wildest story to read in that regard because of what he's pulling from in terms of reference and then it's like I remember reading this the first time and being like, oh, clearly that's Jack the Ripper. And that's not exactly what Moore is saying, but it's so convincing. Right. That chapter ends with uh, Sir William Gall kissing his old lady who's sleeping cozy in bed. And look at how, in that middle panel, how how uh, pleased he is with himself while he's laying there. That's another fun thing not to gloss over is that drawing style. Mm -hmm. This is putting the washes in here. Because we, you know, we talked about that linen paper earlier. Uh, I, I haven't seen that for a couple of chapters, right. but you see Campbell, you know, making a giant 500 page graphic novel and yet still being able to experiment visually. Chapter six is where we introduce our inspector guy. He was, he, he escaped Whitechapel for, for a while, it, it, hoping to just keep going up the ladder. 
Uh, he was working Scotland Yard for a little while. But guess what, man? You're going back. And why is he going back? All chips are against him. There are other Brother Masons who are going to be tasked with running the Whitechapel cases. But they know the deal. They know exactly what's happening. One guy takes the powder is going to straight up Switzerland. Neutral territory, man. He's getting the fuck out of there. Yeah. <laughs> And then and, and, and bad mouthing the investigators on his way out the door, <laughs> saying that he probably could have solved this case in a couple of days if he had been around. Right. <laughs> yeah, it is. All, all the chips are stacked against him. Again, you know, this is stuff that Moore's pulling from some of this reference, where it's like not only is this unsolved, but all these different pieces make it look like it wasn't supposed to be solved. I would draw attention to like these middle panels for several of these pages where we see like the victim, we see the victim's file. A lot of emphasis as you're reading this, look at these middle pages. You know, two master storytellers, that center panel is often, a you know, it's, it's the center of the page. Like everything's built around there. And there are several of these pages as we go through where that's the pivot. You know, like that's the important moment, important image, the takeaway. And for several pages, it was Polly. Right. Another important piece that they play around with storytelling wise in this chapter is uh, panel one of uh, these pages, the time zone, basically, mm -hmm. and the, the calendar date will be seen in various ways, usually with this little day calendar that you rip off, you know, as, as the days go by. Sometimes it'll be a newspaper where uh, we see the progression of the day. I have a note here for uh, page six where they talk about whoever did these crimes. It's almost like surgery. Right. In terms of precision, you know, like organs are being removed and it's and there aren't extra cuts. You yeah. know, like whoever's pulling those organs out knows where to find them and is making one cut and pulling them out. Uh, this story reminds me of surgery because there are so many details and they just weave together. It's immaculate. Like, again, on the reread, like this thing is singing to me. <laughs> you know, the stuff that I would have glossed over the first time right. or didn't register or I didn't realize, make note of this. On the reread, it is just a revelation of like, one thing after another of all these pieces. This, this is a 5,000 piece puzzle that's being put together here, not a 500 piece. Right. Look at this kind of thing. It's like the, f the fade out panel. Eddie Campbell does this kind of stuff again and again, where he's like trying different kinds of drawing styles for different narrative purposes. That's a good example. And there, there are quite a few of them that we're going to see. It really is kind of a master class. I don't, you know, it, it, that's the way to think of it. This is graduate school level comics making here. Like, don't try this for your first <laughs> comic. Don't look at this as a how-to for to try to make a comic when you're beginning. But man, 20 years in, you look at this and it is just, it's masterpiece. It's, it's, these are master craftsmen, really top of their game. Right. There's Polly again, man. We got to got to take a look at the bod and then there's that like real gross guy who's like talking to the dead i think it's her husband like talking to the dead body like i forgive you for all the things you've done to me i'm glad you say that ed i i that stands out to me yeah it's it points to the gender issues that come up again and again in this story it points to the class issues and what a dick that husband is yeah you know like this woman has just had years of horrible living and he's forgiving her on her after being cut apart by some butcher yeah and with the inspector there that has to make your spidey sense tingle a little bit when you have somebody who's like lacks that kind of compassion first panel there you get to see another treatment of letting us know what calendar day it is leather apron becomes uh a, a, a name out of thin air that people here again and again as being associated with uh the the last seen person with Polly or whatever but this this uh what's is his name Abernathy Aberlean Aberlean that's it yeah 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 he's suspicious of that but wants to break the monotony of the day up and of course a proper englishman would never be able to uh be so vulgar you know what i this is the this is the surgery part and that's exactly what he's describing so he goes through some of these other like murders that they're trying to figure out any connection, any find any of these suspects like like your leather aprons. And he says, Smith was raped and tortured. That's cruelty. I can understand cruelty. Right. Tabram was killed by frenzied and repeated stabbing. That's rage. I understand that, too. 
This one's more methodical. Someone near enough did surgery on this woman. I don't understand that at all. Yeah. It's this is this is serial killer shit too. You know, like this is the stuff of I don't understand what this is. Right. This defies uh typical human response. Yeah, and and how funny it is that it's it'll be 60 years later when the idea of like profiling these people is even considered because when it was being done it was still being shit on you know what i mean like we kind of accept it now a hundred years after this yeah it'd be impossible like even the idea nobody even has that idea like he's just racking his brain trying to figure this out and the benefit of this is written a hundred years later right whenever we do understand profiling and stuff but yeah that would have been incredible to propose something like that so once again man it couldn't have been a proper englishman who did this but there's uh buffalo bill cody's in town this is a really i I enjoyed this sequence a lot going back through this some of the stuff that i okay so buffalo bill cody would be like the wild west traveling show yeah be like we're gonna go to england we're gonna have native americans we're gonna have cowboys and shooting and horseback riding wild wild west yeah on a show and so that's what this is these are outsiders that happen to be in in town so we don't think an Englishman could do this kind of dastardly deed. Let's go interview the outsiders. And it's really interesting because it gives more a chance to have the showmanship kind of uh, idea put out there. You know, these guys are put on a show are like, give them illusion, not realism. Talks about America is selling bullshit. And, uh, you know, that's what people want. It's, it's, it feels like fake news. It goes into the fake journalism that's going to happen. Right. Uh, one of the threads that come out of this, but it's really interesting. This idea of like storytelling and selling storytelling to the public. All right. Really great stuff. Kayfabe, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And again, this is probably the benefit of being written a hundred years later. Sure. But it's really fun to read it and think about the influence that this kind of stuff has on how we perceive the world and reality. And, and it's pretty heated, you know, like these oh, are two the, different. They're, 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 the Americans are like, you know, take a fucking like we're out, man. We know our rights. This guy is reading this book that's like prophecies and it's prophesying the rise of uh, America as a superpower. Right. <laughs> and of course, Aberlene's like, what are you talking about? What do you, you know, what are you guys going to be superpower? Yeah. And um, there's going to be war with Germany. The Queen's Germany. Us fight the Queen's <laughs> Germany. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's, it's wild. This scene. Very fun. Very odd. Yeah, and at the beginning of the chapter, you you have the damn, uh, you have the uh, birth of Adolf Hitler. This is the um, this is another in my notes where I reference the wire. It is just like seeing like every single connective thread possible that can go in here. And right. then where do you get to play as a storyteller? And you know, I think Alan Moore has some fun with this scene. When I have it, some fun reading it. One of the next places we're going to be going to, like you said, man, the yellow journalism of uh, of of creating news. So we're going to tell you what day it is by way of the newspaper headline. Yeah, this is a great scene. This is where a crowd gathers at where, where the body was found. Yeah. Rubber neck and like, uh, taking pictures, selfies, posing, posing like, Hey, look, I'm leather apron. And we're walking around (laughs) like a goal. (laughs) Yeah. And also this part, 100% 100% spot on with human behavior, right? Absolutely. People taking selfies at ground zero after 9-11. But this is uh, 9-6. We're going to be putting this lady in the ground now. Following the whole trajectory of like her, her death and and all the posthumous stuff that, that comes along with with death. Um, we get to see the, the Peckerwood husband again. Uh, is he a suspect? Nah, he's a crass, he's gross, but he's a bitch. He ain't, he, he ain't gonna, he didn't kill anybody. And the days are just going by, man, and, and Aberlene is getting nowhere, getting nowhere fast. Yeah, and he's he's fully back in Whitechapel now. And not happy about no, it. No, they go through and describe, like, this is a description of Whitechapel and what it was like at the time. It's, it sounds like hell, yeah. you know? He describes at one point like nine-year-old kids having, brother and sister having sex in the open streets. There's no lodging. Like er, almost everybody there is kind of homeless. Yeah. It is just really, really dark. Like this is a place, this is the worst of the worst. Like, and it, it makes it feel that way. You know, Moore does a really good job establishing that setting as just being awful. And then I love this drawing because you have a very sharp in-focus Aberline as he's entering this bar. 
and the inside's just this impressionistic drawing that to me is like, oh, everybody's a little out of it. They're a little bit drunk. It's almost like looking into the bar, you see the drunkenness. Right. And it contrasts in the same panel with the sobriety of outside of the bar. Crazy bar setting. Uh, we got our Aberleen. He's bumped into one of the future future uh, dead prostitutes, and he's got to kayfabe his way into a conversation with her. Uh, almost almost screws up, man. Talks about, you know, says he's like a leathersmith or something, and he's working on Oh, it's his case I'm working on. Oh, what kind of case? Yeah. He, oh, uh, saddle. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those good human moments, man. I love that police newspaper that they end the page on. If you look in the appendix, he says that's, you know, that's based on the actual newspaper. So it's kind of cool to think of um, how visual those newspapers would have been at the time. Probably like for comics. A, well, f for mostly illiterate populace, right? Right. And then it turns to leaves. Fall setting, I guess. Yeah. Oh, man. Torn right. Envelope, man. Chapter 7. This is... Uh, here, here goes a bunch of the players involved. We got we got uh, the dude that was with the the prince sitting there amongst his paintings, all salty. The guy who really set this whole thing in motion. Yeah. We got Gull. We have newspaper dudes. Leather apron. Look, this could be like the... Uh, you know, these are the ancestors to um, the Watchmen... Uh, Gossip, gossip, news, news magazine people. It's amazing to think of him as the ancestors, but the books created afterwards. So really, the Watchmen dudes from from 1986 are the ancestors, right? This is the uh, the proposed leather apron guy, and he's freaked out. He's he's holed up. Oh yeah, he's scared. Yeah. So we get a little bit with all with all of them, man. There's the prostitutes getting together. They know that their homegirl is toast. One of the more like homely of the prostitutes, the more rotund one, Zoftig, if you will, she invites herself along to this, uh, to the bar to hang out with some dude that was gonna, gonna make time with the other prostitute girl. And they start a whole schmoz, which basically it's, we need to separate the girls and we need, we need uh, our girl to kind of be on her own. Yeah, and it, it continues that thing of just the uh, lack of compassion that exists in these characters' lives. You know, even against each other, it's like dog-eat-dog dog and, right. and the oddness of the drawing in that panel. Yeah. Very, very... Uh, I, I don't know the narrative reason for it, but it's another example of um, Eddie Campbell experimenting or, or at least, you know, a panel that's kind of atypical for the rest of the book. Right. Oh, yeah, and those girls, like, what, what were they fighting over, like, at the very beginning? A fucking piece of soap. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, one says the other one robbed the pickpocket of the guy. Yeah, but even before, like, what got them yeah, to the is. bar, yeah, it it's is. like they have to negotiate for a piece of soap, and the girl's like, well, you know what, you better give it back to me Yes. after. What a horrible, like, it's it's such a depressing, depressing existence, Let's because get her one job is cleaning this guy, his right. pensioner. Yeah. And really, that's just, you know, that's that Japanese soap land shit where it's not about cleaning anything. It's about fucking... Yeah, it's, it's, jerking, it's about this. Jerking a dude off. <laughs> Look at this. After that chapter we read about, you know, like the 12-year-olds getting married and stuff, you see this, like, these little kids that are like a couple. Wow, man. Look at that tree. It's great drawing. It's really cool how it breaks that, the panel grid, too. Yeah. It breaks the panel grid, and all you hear see is Annie, who is going to be the victim in this chapter. Yes. And it looks like that's photocopied, maybe. It, that, it, uh, it does. It's hard to tell. Although distorted. Yeah, it is hard to tell. I, I, I don't know for sure that that's a photocopy, but it wouldn't surprise me just based on how experimental a lot of this artwork is. Yeah. These are the uh, the newspaper guys who are conjuring up some some kayfabe to try to sell more papers yeah this is a great this is really reminds me of wire season five where they talk about you know we sold a bunch of papers off of i don't know if it was leather apron or, or a different a different one but basically giving a name to whatever this killer is that's how you sell papers get a character on that front page right and so their plan is to write a letter if it bleeds it leads annie's been pretty bad man she's she's hasn't been indoors all day she's a walk-in zombie she's sick can't afford food. Yeah, hasn't eaten for a couple of days. A girl gives her a couple shillings or pence or whatever they call them shits. And uh, under the express purposes of not using it for alcohol. 
couple of pages with our proposed leather apron guy who's shitting his pants waiting waiting for the for the popos to show up yeah there's a cop that has him sort of uh th- that's who the cop thinks it is and that cop what's his name upright jack i think or, right and and they speculate on whether that's earned or because it's uh, ironic but either way like he's known for bringing in his suspects and getting confessions <laughs> and you can imagine what that looks like in a white chapel uh, <laughs> dungeon cell and i think at when at some point the newspaper even like names the guy before it's officially supposed to be named so so he's he's holed up just just biding his time i love this drawing too really beautiful lines this is you know fog is setting in there late at night death rides a pale horse everywhere except white chapel because death rides a fucking black carriage with little netley sitting at the top when you see that somebody's not long for this world a lot of penmanship on this a lot of a lot of a lot of pen strokes on this spread here man yeah i like whenever campbell does stuff like this where he's bending his lines it really feels like light radiating out mm. You know, you see it again here. I don't know, something about it's just very effective to me in terms of having that almost light going out into the night. Look at these little desperate hands yeah. showing up, man. And this and this would be that house where it's like, give me my four pennies so that uh, you could you could just have a place to stay indoors for the night. Yeah, and she's there just begging, let me sit here for a little bit. Yeah, and he's okay. like, don't, I don't want to hear you even breathing. This is a neat transition. So remember this uh, this last panel. Whenever we flip the page to the next start, you know it's almost the same shape and everything. The, right. The coins being the eyes. She uh, she overstayed her welcome, man. She stayed in there too long, so she has to she has to bounce. She has to get the hell out, and uh, she bumps directly into Netley, who is the answer to all of her problems. I have this rich guy who's been keeping his eye on you, and he's doing so well that he even. Uh, can afford grapes, which of course are roofied up. Here's another uh, instance where Gall, uh, where, where you could probably guess the Alan Moore invention. Uh, yes and no. There's there's two stuff. So if you read the appendix for this, mm-hmm. the story is the the people that live in this apartment would report these ghost like visions of a couple walking by the window, decades into the future. Sure. You know, um, and so Alan Moore spins that around and makes those ghosts be Gall and, and uh, Annie Chapman walking by and so we see from the ghost or, or from these you know like the ghost you know point of view of gall looking in right and you know he plants the idea of gall having these visions of god and things early on and talking about different visions so it kind of makes sense that gall is experiencing these like really strange moments yeah and and it's kind of neat that it's based on a ghost story right it's just he's now taking the ghost point of view that's pretty cool yeah. that is super cool man and it's another one of those details. Like, how's he even find that information? Just one sentence in one book, probably. I remember reading, I forget who the author was that came to town, but they they uh, were promoting their, their latest book. And at the, to- at the talk that they were giving, they said they read like, you know, six books, you know, thousands of pages of stuff. And what ultimately ended up in the book was like three pages of material from like all this, ma- all this shit that they absorbed. But it creates a richness. I made that comment, I think it was on our last From Hell video about the documentary filmmaker that would shoot 100 hours and end up with 90 minutes. And somebody's like, that's nothing. Some of these documentary filmmakers shoot thousands of hours and end up with the 90 minutes. So it, it is true, you know, and I'm sure Alan Moore went through thousands of pages to get to this point. And this point is the the end of Annie. You know, she's done. Does he take her? He takes her wedding ring. What a vicious bastard. Yeah, it's some of those little things, I think, is what Alan Moore has to make work. You know, right. like there'll be a record of there was a ring on her finger, there were abrasions like it was taken off, or yeah. there were pennies, you know, at her feet. You know, like these these little details that are kind of odd. And so sometimes I think those are moments with gall that are a little bit weird. You mm-hmm. know, like like he might explain them as like almost divine or, you know, why are you laying that stuff out? Right. The reason is because 100 years later, there's a record of that stuff being laid out. Yeah. And all the stuff with the, 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 the guts on the shoulder and all that, how it points to certain masonic rituals and junk it is great though um you know you see a couple of people come out of this building and walk by or then they find the body it's neat how that stuff there are records of like who sees what and when yeah and the amount of people that are there and also narratively uh he he could he adds a piece about 
it's the case is being stepped on. The evidence is getting fucked with and people are being made aware of it. Like civilians are coming into the scene and taking souvenirs and picking stuff up. And this particular one, if you read the appendix of it, grape skins were found in this alleyway. You know, so like great detail, great yeah. detail. I mean, those grapes, we see that every time with gall. Right. Apparently there were some found that were, you know, written about in the evidence for the case. Did you read anything about that laudanum stuff being found in the girl's body? But as I say that, it makes me wonder, like, how how intricate were autopsies back then? Like, could they run those kind of tests? Yeah, I, did, I, didn't, I don't remember reading that, but also... There's a lot to read here. Yeah. You know, I bet you could reread this book your whole life and, and continue to find details. Right. So I'm, right. I'm certainly not an expert at, at, you know, at this work. And this kind of thing is like, you know, done over a decade's worth of time. It has to be done. Even, even if you could, even if Eddie Campbell could draw 500 pages in 500 days, the amount of stuff put in here, it's, you need a lot of time. This is the uh, the cops, Aberlein, you know, asking if you believe this leather apron thing. And he's like, thick, the name of the cop. He gets results. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> he's not busting Jack the Ripper, but bring in that poor, the poor guy that he thinks is guilty. And, and I guess beat him around a little bit. See if you can get a confession out of him. Yeah, man, it'll, you know, make the day go by easier. Like you'll have, you'll have a cleared case. And Aberlein dresses him down. Johnny Upright is, uh, is is what that cop's known as. And he really, uh, that whole page is him just dressing him down like, you're, you're out. <laughs> Don't let me hear your name and see your name in the newspapers again. Continuing the whole thing of, of uh, just an impossible situation for this Aberlein guy. And, you know, he's, he's, he's our protagonist in a story. He's our hero of, of this story. And we know that he's going to fail. So it's like you stack the chips against the guy so that it makes the failure a little more acceptable or something. It adds to the dread. Yeah. Because we see him as an old man still regretting this case. Right. We hear about him working for 15 years to get out of Whitechapel and then he's put back in and we know the outcome is terrible for him. Yeah. He lives with it the rest of his life. It's just one more dreadful element of this whole dreadful story. And, and every other page, there's another sequence, another part of the conspiracy and sometimes like you know when it's the news guys the conspiracy they, like they're in, involved in their own conspiracy so there are conflicting conspiracies involved in this thing to just create confusion and then gall has his own extra bit of conspiracy that he's going to like try to weave into the thing so there's like three separate strands sending this guy on all these different directions and that's just frankly a waste of time yeah you have to wonder like this probably happens all the time when somebody's trying to you know a journalist or a detective investigating anything is trying to get to the to the case even if it's well-intentioned just yeah. all the chaotic noise and information and everybody trying to be helpful even if it's well-intentioned it still just messes up you know it still just adds cloudiness and information that's not useful or maybe not accurate to these kinds of investigations like even if you're doing your best it's still not necessarily going to uh to, to, to work out that way and certainly in this case it's not everybody trying to do their best those journalists are trying to sell sell papers like they say we need a villain you know like it has nothing to do with helping the, the poor detective so let's throw another monkey wrench into the whole system and introduce a second lady named mary kelly yeah, this part, uh, we mentioned in the first four chapters at times being confused by characters. This sequence confuses me quite a bit. This is a... Because these are new characters out of left field, right? Right, right. And again, you know, they're here because it's based on real people that were involved, but it's a little bit confusing as a, as a reader. I, it makes me wonder if these are discoveries that Alan Moore made around, like, years... Partway through the Exactly, writing. because, you know, if he had it to do over again, he would build them in earlier... You know, let's just throw more confusion at uh, Aberleen. And this time, the confusion, it's even going to touch uh, Sir William Gull a little bit. Yeah, and real quick, it, we see the two surviving prostitutes kind of crying about... They still think it's the local gang yeah, the that is extorting mob. them. And they need 
a lot more money than they can scrape together. It's why they started the blackmail plot was to get that money to pay off the gang for protection. So they're under the impression that local gang is now is, is killing them. Yeah. Like they're not getting their money soon enough, and two of their friends are now dead. And they are going to do everything they can to uh, to get that cash to just like end this misery. That's 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 their motivation for this issue. By the way, when you're a uh, a new character, a new poor woman in this setting, and you're introduced in this book. It's not good. No, you're not. You're not here for to solve the case. Oh, no, <laughs> no. Cut to the prince who knows that this bloodshed is being done in his name, and he's a gay guy. He's like bisexual or something. Is that what I we're doing right I, there? I can't. I don't know. It feels like that's the implication of this scene. But my takeaway is it's this guy who married a woman, had a kid, was pulled away by his uh, grandmother. And doesn't doesn't care at all about the kid or the or the woman he married. Right. Yeah, just a little Lord Fauntleroy. Just deadbeat dad. D- totally narcissistic. You know, he, he's worried about him and his relationship with this guy who refers to the queen as grandmother, and is like, "There's a note here," or I think the prince says that it's like, "You can you could be killed for that." Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Don't call her that. <laughs> we we can't we ha- still hang commoners for calling her grandmother. <laughs> commoners. I like these kind of, I like these kind of images, you know, like the street scenes, you know, like it's something that might just be a background of what's going on around town. The perspective of this looks like it's traced from a photo, not the characters, but the background looks like it's got this like bubble lens. It is weird. Kind of image that that's looks like it was taken from a weird lens camera. Throughout uh, the past couple of chapters, when we introduced Aberlene, he he would talk with Mary Mary Kelly, right? Yeah, one of the she prostitutes. calls herself Emma. Right, but there was like the one girl who goes by two names, which creates the confusion. Right. Yeah, I think I have a feeling a lot of these women may have used aliases. Sure. Because they do bounce around with names. Several of them, the characters in this book, bounce around with names. Hey, man, the strippers at Club Erotica. Her name ain't Cherry. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you're staying in the same town, man. You better fucking use a fresh name or else you're, you're going to have a stalker or two. So the the one prostitute, she, she's, she's got major money troubles. Aberlene is like the one good guy in her life because he's, he needs, le- he, he needs clues and he's undercover here. He's not looking to trick. Uh, he gives her a couple dollars, and she thanks him for it. Man, you didn't even try to fuck me, man. That's real cool of you. But then she kisses him, and he's like, oh, man, am I going to have to get tested? <laughs> no? You're, I was thinking he was fa- for falling for her, but yeah, okay. I was thinking, like, oh, man, do I got a bump on my lip now? How long does it take for them to <laughs> come up? <laughs> this is a pretty fun sequence. This is Aberlene going through the suspects and trying yeah. to figure out what works and doesn't and... He has two suspects, and neither one of them are any good, and he knows it. Bullocks to one, and, uh, you know, fuck uh, Lieutenant Thick or whatever his name is. So he's got to go back out on the streets, go back home. See, this is the moment why I was thinking he's falling for this. Yeah. Because when he's home with his wife, she's being real nice to him. Because he was saying the name Emma the night before in his sleep. Is his wife's name Emma? Like, I guess man, so. I, I don't know if my wife would appreciate me calling out some other woman's name while I'm sleeping. Sure, yeah, like it, like it, it must be. We got we got Net, Netley getting caught in his feelings a little bit. There's a ro- famous Robert Crumb strip called Bobo Belinsky where it just shows the same character in like five different angles. And to me, this is like a version of Bobo Belinsky. Just see him in a bunch of different angles, but he's obviously in a little bit of turmoil, but not so much that he still can't uh, help. Uh, Uncle Uncle William Gall out, but he's got to get a little bit sauce to do S- so. Self medicating. Yeah. Yeah, he's expressed his uh, how how difficult this is for him. Even talking about it in the beginning, before any of it happened, it was he sort of had trouble with it. Right. Look, we got some Mason some Mason imagery right there. Uh, and now this part this part confused me a little bit when Gall meets with these dudes and they're like, you know. We got orders for you to stop the murders, blah, blah, blah. And 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 Gull is like, so this is sent after the first killing, but you say murders? like so Yeah, he decides the note's bullshit. Right. Which I guess it is. Yeah. You know, this police commissioner is really not, this sucks. <laughs> you know, these are the worst murders in, in, in Whitechapel, London history or whatever. And 
according to this story, this police commissioner knows who's doing it. You know, like he's trying to just like, come on, please stop doing this. <laughs> yeah. And it's so the commissioner knows, but so do some like bo- straight up bobbies. Like we'll, we'll see. We'll see those moments play out here in a little bit as well. Well, yeah, we will. I don't know if they if they know exactly what is going on or who's doing it. They just get little bits of orders. So one of the orders that, that Gaul leaves here is like if Marie C- Kelly's crosses your path any of your policemen let me know about it right and so they have those orders but maybe not necessarily knowing why yeah. somebody's looking for that, her that's fair these backgrounds ridiculous it's beautiful all, all the drawings are just stunning yeah the throwaway kind of backgrounds you know little signage the bricks the alleys the streets the cobblestone streets it's all just amazing so Aberlin gave our girl enough money more than enough money that should satisfy that Nichols mob, um, the people that she suspects as killing her homies. So she meets up with them. And once again, man, the lack of streetwise in these in these prostitutes, like nowadays, man, chicks are much hipper. She makes sure that these are the Nichols guys, and they're like, yeah, sure. She gives them the loot that she got. And they're like, huh, what? And, and it becomes very clear they tell her that, oh, yeah, they're not the ones. We didn't do those ladies in. Those ones, meaning that they definitely have done similar things in the past. And she is fully desperate now. She got rid of her money. She thought that this was going to be, this was going to solve all her problems. She's back at square one. And she doesn't even have the loot to stay at the little Doss house. Great moment. Yeah. Because this is... Her hopes of survival are gone. She is as clueless now as as most of the as the police, you know, as the detective in terms of like, what do you mean it's not you? Right. I have no other leads. There's a psycho killing my friends. Yep. And really sold well in that last panel with just a black abyss. Her in outer space. Yeah. What's what, what's more hopeless than just a tear of black ink? Yep. Fucking Netly, man, comes across. So a couple pages ago, we see a couple of policemen uh, tell tell a phone, telegraph, tell a policeman, right. whispering to each other uh, in there, and you know, passing through basically that we've gotten this woman whose name we were told to look for. She's in drunk tank, right? And so he, that part is starting. That network of information is starting from the police. This is one of the the original prostitutes. Yes. This is Liz. So she's on the list. Unfortunate for her. And I think this is the one that he says, wait for an hour. I'm going to go get uh, get my, my master who's been looking for you. Yeah. And you know what? He's a rich ass dude. Like, here, man, I'm going to buy a half a pound of grapes and I'm going to let you get a couple. And now as if all the great art that we've seen so far isn't enough, it's raining. So now we get to see like the wheels going through the wet streets and splashes and stuff. Eddie's getting bored and just showing off now. <laughs> But you know how it goes, man. Alamore read it rain that night. I was going to say, he probably does know exactly what the weather was whenever this second body or third body is found. I consulted a poor Richard's almanac from 1899. Have some Marxists talking some sh- talking some shit. Because Alamore probably read that there was a Marxist meeting. The first witnesses of the dead body were probably Marxists. Some connection to the whole class stuff that's going, that's, you know, a big part of this book. It's just connecting as many of these dots as you can. The murders are getting more and more kind of careless, more... Pressure's mounting. Right. But also, Gall is like... He's enjoying it to the point where he's like losing his logical part of his mind. It's like psychosexual or something at this point, man. The dude is like fucking into it. And by the way, his prey... Is looking for it too, you know. You 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 give off the wrong vibe, and these women are on edge. You right. know, now that it's happened to a couple of their friends, like they're out of their minds with paranoia. Right. You know, if that grape doesn't taste right, what's going? What are you feeding me, dude? Yeah. Look at Gull just lunging. Yeah. Netly Netly helping out. This is um, brutal stuff. It is brutal, brutal. Tim Vigil, Black Blood. Very dark, and as he gets away. Knife still in hand, the uh, the cops find him. Right. Say, I've been looking for you because... Uh, are you looking for this lady? Yeah. But then to, to throw one more chink in the armor, one more set of obfuscation 
to who possibly did this. This building is contains like a Jewish shop or something. And he's going to write, you know, the, the Jews are the men who will not be blamed for nothing. Whatever that means. And he spells it incorrectly on purpose. Yeah, uh, which is a Mas- Mas- Masonic spelling. However, we don't know that he wrote this. This is right. one of the bigger um, things that Alan Moore sort of... What we know is this was found written next yeah. to that bloody rag. Right. Um, it's speculative on Moore's part that this was written to kind of just add to the to the chaos, to the noise of all of this. How about this piece here? It feels it feels very like incongruous to all the art we've seen for about two hundred fifty pages. He's laying down some some zipatone and uh, has entered Guy Davis Baker Street. <laughs> yes. Kind of uh, line art. <laughs> It's so different. It is. I I agree. It's. I don't know what the intent is there. You know, I I'm not sure. But Maybe then he's the also is because, by the way, the character we see there, that's the prostitute Gall was after. Right. He picked the wrong person because of the name confusion um, from the police. Yeah. You know, but the woman that he killed is not the woman he was after. Yeah. And he laments that it's a shame there were only four of them. Five would have had a lot more power if there were five. Right. Mary Kelly comes home, you know, despite being a prostitute, like she she does have sort of this common law husband, but he did hear that. Like he heard right. Liz was killed, which was true. And he heard Mary Kelly was killed. And I mean, like this, everybody's obsessed with this. This yeah. is your front page of the newspaper. So everyone's aware of this happening. And that's what he heard. And so when she comes home, it's relief for both of them, but then terror for her because she hadn't heard this and that her name was used. Like, yeah. this is bad stuff. How did, you have to leave. Oh, yeah. You know, like, they have to get out. I right. guess it's just not an option, but... Yeah, I mean, there's... If you're her, you know you're done. At this <laughs> point, like, all of my friends have been killed. Somebody was killed with my name. Never use your name again. Like, change your name... Tomorrow. This page. Yeah, exactly. Tell your husband not to call you that. That's not your name anymore. Because okay. somebody's after you. Amazing panel here because yeah. this is not comforting. Those are not comforting looking hands. They're big, ominous looking hands. Even though it's our husband, that's that's a scary image. The hands are great throughout this. That's Everything, true. you know, Campbell's great, but there's so much emphasis on hands from the surgeon, you know, cutting people up to this kind of stuff. It, it's really, it's brutal, but beautiful. The hatching on the clothes instead of the outside. Boom. Four more chapters down, Jimmy. And we got uh, f- three dead prostitutes and one uh, poor poor lady who had a similar name to another prostitute. Still going to go downhill from here. It's weird. This is halfway point. Yeah. You yeah. know, almost everybody's collected now. So what do we have coming up in eight more chapters? Tune in. Find out. <laughs> it's been a while since I read. So I'm, I'm curious myself. Jimmy, let's bounce, dude. Got more comics to read. K favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when the next vids are available. Octobriana's in stores right now. Selling out quick, man. So get it while it's hot. If you see it, scoop it up because it's going to be worth $500 <laughs> next time you see it. Uh, Red Room, my current comics project is being serialized right now on Patreon for the early adopter. Uh, Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. Three bucks gets you the archive. About five dozen strips up there right now as, as of this recording, and I put new ones up there every Tuesday. And again, if you're enjoying From Hell coverage and you made it this far into the video, you will love Red Room. I don't know about surgical precision, but there's definitely disembowelments. <laughs> <laughs> you can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we're doing. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, give them the marching orders, man. We got some, some From Hell to read. Read more comics.